um, and it takes away from that personal connection. Uh, and so it's really important. We don't say, all phones are bad, throw them away. Um, we just say, okay, let's figure out how to put some bounds around this to keep it healthy. So one of those is scheduling off time. So a start and stop time for the day. Um, and, and this pairs with at night, especially for your kids, they turn their electronics in. They don't need to go to bed with it. Um, and that is linked to sleep problems in kids because same reason, they can't like stop looking at it. Um, and they don't like to turn the volume off. Uh, so even just that little like bing, is just enough to keep them in higher levels of sleep when the phone is there. So everybody turns in their stuff at the end of the day and then in the morning, once you've gotten up, brushed your teeth, gotten dressed, you can take a bath. Um, and then no media use during meal times. Uh, as a person who does more marital therapy than child therapy, I can tell you this is a regular complaint in marriages as well as parent to child. Uh, I'm sitting at the restaurant with my spouse and they spend half the time on their phone. Um, and people get mad. They get hurt by that. Uh, and, you know, you may have had meals in your own family where you're sitting there, this lovely meal that you've made, or this nice place you're eating out, and everyone's here. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not fun. <laughs> and it doesn't feel like connection, most certainly. So, putting some limits around specific times. At the dinner table, we don't sit with our phones. Uh, at family events, when we're there with grandma and grandpa, we are all of an age where we went to visit our family members and it was boring. <laughs> a lot of the time they were talking about things we didn't care about and people we didn't know, and we sat through it. Uh, and it was and it was good. It was respectful. We learned how to kind of tolerate some frustration and some boredom. Uh, how to go into our inner space and just you know whatever. Uh, and so it's not a bad thing for kids to learn to do that. And it means a lot to the other people because it's another thing I hear pretty frequently from grandparents. I see my grandkids, but they're checked out. Um, it doesn't feel good. Uh, and then also during homework time, that is absolutely a time when phones should be not even in sight because of that thing. If they're there, it's distracting. And so they go away. We just put them away. And at first, trying to do some of these things, you're going to get pushback. They're going to be mad. Why? It's not fair. Uh, that's okay. That never hurt anybody. It's annoying. But as parents, we get used to putting up with the annoying sometimes because we know what's healthier for them sometimes more than they do. Um, and then this one too, no, who is the killer? No television in the bedroom. Um, it, especially for kids, also for adults, really. Um, it absolutely disrupts sleep quality. And I have so many people who say, but I fall asleep to the TV. I couldn't fall asleep without the TV. I guarantee you, you're not resting. Whatever you think is happening during that time is not happening in the way that you want it to. Um, and so it's, it's breaking a habit. Your body's gotten used to that as a cue to fall asleep, but you can get used to other cues. It just takes a little time. So wait till you have Christmas break or you know a little bit of time off and just retrain. That's all it takes. Um, and for kids, the same is true. They sleep less and they sleep with less sleep quality when they have a TV in their room. Um, so know the apps your child is using. Now we hear this all the time and as parents it's like, yeah, I know, but I don't get it. Um, and so there are, there is technology to help. And sometimes parents will say, you know, I don't want to police them. I don't want, I want them to feel like I trust them. I want, I don't want them to think I'm looking over their shoulder all the time. Um, but there are reasons why we do this. Uh, why do we not let, why do we not let a baby use a compound saw? I mean, we could read the instructions.
instructions to them, shouldn't that be enough? Um, if they're listening, they shouldn't have a problem with it. Uh, however, their brains are not developed. <laughs> uh, their bodies aren't developed in that case. But for adolescents as well, their frontal lobes, the part of their brain that allows them to um, predict consequences, to control impulsivity, um, to kind of learn from what's happened before and apply it to the next time, it's coming along. But until they are about 23, 24 years old, it's not fully developed. So all the things that you tell them about healthy social media use, good decisions when you're texting or when you're interacting online, um, mm, sometimes they might hit it, uh, but the right kind of set of circumstances comes about and all of that goes out the window. It's like giving the baby the car keys. They might be able to make it around the block, but they might hit a couple mailboxes on the way. Um, so we have to recognize it's not, a, it's not a trust versus not trust or good kid versus bad kid. It's just brain development, that's all. Um, and so it's our job as parents to sometimes recognize what some of their limitations are. It doesn't mean that you have to constantly give me your phone, let me look at it and look through every one of their texts every time. Um, but we have to have a little bit of oversight on some of it. Um, a really good app that has come up more recently is called Bark. Um, and so this one, I just have to give this one a little bit of a plug because it shortcuts a little bit of this feeling about I have to police. Um, and what it does is you link it up with their social media accounts and it basically monitors for key words, key types of images, things like that that relate to bullying, to inappropriate comment, uh, con content, uh, et cetera, and it flags it. So if they are texting and talking and it's not problematic, you don't have to look at it. Um, it's going to let that go. It's filtering that out but it catches the things that it needs to catch so that you know if something's going on that needs to be discussed with them or addressed. So it kind of helps balance a little bit of that. But things like Disney Family Circle, Covenant Eyes, um, being your child's friend on social media, the lamest friend they have. Um, and you know, that one's limited because of course they can hide things. We all know you can hide things from uh, your friends. <laughs> and all that that you, that you don't want to deal with. Um, so, but it's still not a bad idea. It keeps them having that sense that, okay, someone's out there that is paying attention uh, to what's going on. Um, and I do strongly, strongly recommend having a filter on your computers. Um, we have one that goes into our um, wireless router. So everything in the house that's on wireless is subject to it. You don't have to put it on specific machines. Um, and that's kind of nice, because even whether you're on your phone or your laptop or computer, it's catching what's, you know, what's being typed in. Um, and uh, it's helped in a couple different situations. And there was a time when we switched routers and had to reinstall it, and we got caught by it, not because of anything intentional, but because my eight-year-old thought it would be funny to Google butt. Uh, and he found what he was Googling. <laughs> uh, and then as I was looking through the history for a whole different reason, I found what he was Googling too. Um, which was really as a parent, like, there's a funny element and there was a horrifying element of it. Having to then go back and say, what were you, I felt like the mom from, um, from A Christmas Story that was like, what? He what? <laughs> uh, kind of trying to deal with that situation. So having the filter on actually does help. Uh, highly recommend. Uh, and then two, being a model of healthy social media use. What they see us doing informs what they feel is okay to do. It sets their templates for what's normal. So if we are the parent who's constantly on our device, who's constantly kind of checked out not present even when we're present, it's really hard to convince them that that's not the best way to be. Um, so, you know, it starts at home first, 
as far as making healthier habits. And so I know, you know, even for the parents, I've got friends who there's a point when they turn in their phones, everybody turns in their phones, and um, then the kids do too, and it's no argument because we're all doing the same thing. Um, so another one, don't return to the calendar that's full of stuff. Uh, being, being busy is good. Having things to do, being involved, having kids who are involved is a good thing. Um, so, so we don't want to swing too far on either side of that to where we're kind of locking them down and you can't do things because we need you to have downtime or we're doing so many things we can't see straight. Uh, either side of that is not the healthiest space to be. So research says more time spent in activities is directly related to higher anxiety. Um, it can weaken family bonds and kids don't know how to entertain themselves. Their lives are so scheduled, so filled. When they have downtime, they don't know what to do with it. I have a bunch of adults like that who when they actually have a little bit of free time, it kind of freaks them out because they don't know how to manage it. And that's just a learning thing. Um, but when we've gotten so used to not having it, we forget what to do. So we don't want our kids to be in that place. So again, the key is balance, um, not one thing or the other. Um, it's healthy for everybody to have some downtime, but it should not be filled with media. That's our mistake. That's our COVID mistake that we want to learn from, is what we do with that downtime. So it should be used to encourage some creativity, um, to encourage some real connection. Um, and so then we can also, as parents, reinforce that. It's okay to bribe a little bit. It really is. So if I, this is, I use this lightly, but actually you can use it for real. Um, so you've got an hour, screens are off. If you can go that whole hour without coming and saying the words bored to me, you're earning something. You're earning a privilege. You're earning a positive. Um, and so, because that's what I hear all the time. I'm bored. I'm bored. I don't know what to do. And then I name 10 things. I don't like any of those. <laughs> so, so we, we want them to be able to be excited about other things. And so it is okay to reinforce that. Um, so part of it too, and this is another one where people, mm, depending on what things look like currently, you may or may not love what I'm about to say. Um, no more than one high commitment activity at a time. I have a very dear friend whose kids are on two different travel teams, plus a house league, and um, on top of that, they have various other family commitments. And she showed me her calendar, and I about threw up. Um, because every day was filled with like three or four things. And for her as a mom, I was like, my gosh. But thinking about that for the kids, too, that's overwhelming. Um, so kids should not have something scheduled every night of the week. I know that we want to expose them to a lot of things, and we want to set them up to be like really well-rounded people. But at a certain point, it's overkill. Um, and, and it doesn't mean anything anymore. They're not invested in it anymore. Um, Schedule 20 minutes of family time five days a week. If you're looking at that and saying, I don't know how I would possibly be able to do that, it means you're overscheduled. <laughs> it says something. If we can't squeeze in 20 minutes for our kids five days a week, that something's off. And we really need to step back and look at what we're agreeing to. What are we saying yes to that's disrupting that? Um, and, Together time can look like cooking a meal together. You can hit two bases at once. As a, as a parent, uh, you know, well, I've got to do the laundry. I've got to make dinner. I've got to bring them in on it and use that as talk time. It's not like it has to be just like one activity or the other. Um, so you can, come, you can double up a little bit to make it work. Um, no activity home nights at least two to three times a month. So that means, so your 20 minute nights, you could have something else that you're doing. Maybe you're getting fast food on the way to the game, but you actually go in and sit down and eat the food together. Um, but there should be at least a couple nights a month where you literally have nothing. You have nowhere to be but at home together. 
embrace the no. this is a grown up skill but we want that was a little dirty um but we want our kids to be okay with saying no to things and if as parents if we can't say no to anybody how on earth are they going to learn that and so really discerning how much time is this thing going to take and how much value kind of emotionally community wise all those things am i actually getting from that thing or am i just saying yes because i feel bad or i feel like i'll disappoint someone that's a you issue that you need to work on um, so start teaching them that it's okay to say no sometimes uh, and then get outside weather permitting but even in the snow go out and play in the snow um, shoot hoops on the driveway or at the park whatever but fresh air does a lot for mood um, and also for connection um, so that's why we walk together with people um, there's something better about it than walking alone sometimes um, depends on who you are uh, so um, be what you would want your kids to be so when you think about yourself and how you experience life is this is my level of joy in the life that I live this what I would want my kids to have in their lives as adults because if the answer is no like I'm stressed out and overwhelmed all the time again something needs to change because that means you're modeling something to them that's that they're going to pick up on and they're going to replicate because they won't know any other way and so some of that maybe does mean sometimes saying no um, some of that does mean prioritizing certain parts of your life to allow for that because we want them to learn good balance we're not raising little machines um, there are too many adults who are that high stress type a driven 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 there are good parts of that there are functional parts of that but we're finding a lot of them end up in therapy uh, so let's not um, you know I want to work myself out of a job <laughs> so um, so a couple other ways that you can help just quickly help them to re-regulate their schedules around sleep and meal times um, have an actual consistent bedtime not like rigid but just at, at this time we start winding down and heading to bed we eat consistent meals and we sit down to do it as often as we possibly can um, help them get involved in helping around the house um, being a member of a community means helping the other people in that community and if they're not being involved in that you're doing them a disservice because you're not raising people who are going to see the needs in their own community and step up to help um, and being involved in something uh, is good for mood it's good for decreasing anxiety um, encourage them to re-engage with some of their friends and their activities but again don't put too much pressure around it it's okay if they need to take that slowly as long as you can see a little bit of movement in that direction some of the kids that were harder hit by pandemic or who are a little more anxious they may be a little slower to warm back up into some of that and that's okay but we just want to see a direction to it um, return to regular in-person church services um, it really is good it's better than the virtual um, and for so many reasons not only related to your faith life but also related to your community um, and your connections with that and expect a little bit of pushback uh, even among the grown-ups in the house a little sighing um, in the morning when you're getting up it's okay as long as everybody gets up and does it that's what matters um, and then join them in the activities that they enjoy I can't tell you how many unbelievably stupid YouTube videos I've watched uh, over the time with my kids um, but I know what they're watching and we laugh <laughs> together <laughs> about it um, so so and that too is kind of bonding for them so often we ask them to join us in our activities but we don't always meet them in theirs so I tell parents too if your kids sitting and playing a video game sit down and watch with them don't be the like who's that why are they doing that what's going on um, don't do that just sit quietly um, and watch at first they might kind of like what are you doing this is weird uh, that's okay 
they actually may kind of enjoy it more than they let on because they get to show off something that a lot of times they feel pretty good at. Um, so, and again, it gives you a window into their world a little bit. So, um, there were a couple questions that came in that I want to hit really quickly, and then for anybody who's interested in staying to ask any more questions, you'll be more than welcome to do that. Um, so, one of the questions, um, our 10-year-old seems to have a hard time between after school and home, um, oftentimes a little moody. We found that if we give her a little space prior to starting homework, that seems to help and not to bombard her with a bunch of questions about how was school. Um, she's usually happy, but transition seems challenging. And then all of a sudden, before bed, everything uh, about the day comes out. Then she wants to talk. Um, and so any ideas for kind of how to approach this? So, so what I really like in this question is the idea that parents are in tune with their kids' rhythms. Um, it is true that for some kids, putting themselves through the school day, by the time they get to the end of the day, they're pretty worn thin emotionally. And so conversation is not really their thing, especially if they're a little more introverted, uh, which is not a bad thing, it's just a style. Um, and so it's okay that by the time they get the end of the day, they don't really want to talk a whole lot. They don't want to interact. And I like that their parents are noticing that about them and trying to work with that rhythm. The, the downside of it, of course, is that, okay, now it's time for bed, and now the chatterbox comes out and wants to tell all about the day. So how do we work with that? Um, and what I would say is, uh, just practically speaking, I would just shorten up bedtime. So like, not bedtime, but like if you, let's say normally they're going to bed at 9 o'clock or 8.30, um, instead of starting that process around 8 of getting your jammies on, brushing your teeth, all that stuff, let's start it at 7.30. Why don't you go up, get your jammies on, I'll come up and sit down, we can talk a little bit before you get all the way ready for bed. That way you're still working with her rhythm. Um, you're giving her that space after school to kind of decompress a little bit, but you're not shortcutting her sleep uh, either. And so she feels attended to and heard, but we're still kind of keeping the flow of the day where it needs to be. Um, so so that, that would, I think that would be a good starting place with her. This one came in, how do we help our kids be able to engage and interact with charity towards their peers who are woke? Now, this is a really good question, and it's a really um, relevant question uh, at the moment because there's a lot of talk around these things. It's also a question, I, as I read it, like all the layers of that hit me <laughs> really quickly. Um, and I thought, I, I want to be careful with this one um, a little bit. So I let my inner nerd run free first um, in this, uh, and I looked it up. <laughs> so so what, is, what does woke mean? Um, generally speaking, that is aware of and actively attentive to important facts and issues, especially issues of racial and social justice, per Merriam-Webster. Um, so that sounds like a great thing. That sounds like good character. Um, that sounds like something we would want our kids to be, per this definition, right? Um, we also know that, again, there are a few more layers to that in the way that I'm sure that the person asking that question was thinking about a different facet of the word woke and what that means. And that has arisen from, out of reaction to some things that were seriously underdone and it has also, on the flip side, in certain ways, been overdone. Um, and so because of that, it's actually a really polarizing potential question. Um, but at the base of it, at the heart of that question, is how do we get our kids to engage and interact with charity toward people who hold different values and opinions from our own, uh, or from their own? How do we do that in a way that's healthy and that's good for our community? And um, We've seen over social media in the last year 
adults have a really hard time with this. <laughs> um, and so, again, we're asking our kids to do something that we ourselves don't always, don't always approach in the best way. Um, and I think starting from a place of sometimes the most charitable way to respond is not to respond. Um, we don't always have to openly disagree with everyone. Sometimes people will say things, and we know this as adults and as working adults, people will have opinions that we don't like or that we don't agree with or it's different than ours. Sometimes it's something we feel like is not totally healthy for them. Um, but we don't always have to say so. And I think encouraging our kids to just sometimes be willing to nod and smile and move on in the conversation is a good thing. And then I think too, you know, looking at how do I um, start by seeing the things I can agree with, in, not necessarily in this person's position, but just with them as a person. How do I acknowledge some truth? Uh, maybe in what they're saying, um, how do I validate some part of that, not the parts that don't feel right or healthy to me, but just some of the basic things. Um, acknowledging a feeling, that sounds really frustrating. Um, because, and I can do that without ever saying, and I agree with you about every other part of what you said. Um, mm -mm, not necessarily. Uh, and trying to find in the other person what God sees in them, first, and like, let me approach you from that standpoint. Um, and I have very dear friends who we can talk on any number of subjects, we cannot talk politics. It's just a no. So it's okay sometimes to say, you know, I don't really feel comfortable talking around that, but let's talk about something else. Because you know, you value them as a person, just not always every single piece of kind of how they're looking at things. And that is true across the board. It doesn't matter what kind of side of an issue someone's on, unless it's something that's a safety risk, in which case that's, we don't keep those things secret um, or keep them to ourselves or ignore them. But otherwise, we can let a lot go, honestly. And especially right now, um, because people are so pitched in, in their beliefs about certain things, um, we just, sometimes it's easier to let it go. Um, and that that, again, is the more charitable response to it. Um, but, but we don't want kids that are ignoring social justice. We don't want kids that are ignoring racial discrimination or sex discrimination. Um, so we do want them aware and attentive to those things, um, just in a way that allows them to be most effective in that um, with their peers. So I love Mother Angelica. She said she has some serious gems. And um, she, she talked about joining our experience with Christ. Um, and the way that she applied it was so funny because she was talking about meetings and like how many pointless, ridiculous meetings did Christ sit through uh, where he was probably like, come on, people, seriously. And so she said, I sit through those meetings too. So sometimes when I'm sitting in that meeting, I try to think about okay, Christ did this, he experienced this, and you know, how can I kind of capture his experience as part of mine and get through this moment in a graceful way? So one of her other quotes, if you're experiencing stress or tension, give it to Jesus. Tell him, I feel like crawling the wall, but I love you and I want to give this to you. Do you think our Lord was intense living with those 12 screwball apostles? <laughs> um, and so the same thing, when we're encountering people who engage a topic differently than we do, remember, how much of that did Christ experience? A lot. And so if he could get through those moments gracefully, sometimes with conviction, yes, sometimes with some grace, uh, then surely I too can, can mirror that a little bit. Um, and then last question, could you please share ideas on how to build a child's self-confidence and social skills? I have a child who struggles with social anxiety. Um, so the short, the short answer to this is they have to get experiences. Um, and that's the hardest thing when you have social anxiety, is to get experiences being out and being social. So as parents, our job is to kind of provide the foundation first um, by working with them 
through some of their fears. I've got a couple of really good books up here. Feel free, like if you if you want to ask later, or I think Sister's going to post the slides, so you'll be able to pull those titles. Um, but starting by talking about the feeling, and then encouraging them, toes in the water, little by little, to start getting some experience being out and with their peers, just for short periods of time, a little bit. You can use um, like social stories or conversations where you kind of play out a conversation with them. Um, so that then they have the chance to get a little practice with what that would be like uh, and then start encouraging them out. Again, not into let's go full bore and, and sign you up for summer camp, um, but, uh, you know, let's go to that party. Let's sign up for that class, like the one day class that you can go to and, and get a little experience with some peers uh, and then we build on that. Um, if it's something where some of those basic things are just, it's not working, I would add, there's my plug again for counseling. I would say, get someone in, into the mix who can help give them some more skills um, so that they can re-engage. But at the end of the day, the answer is going to be they've got to get practice with it. Um, so uh, don't build them up falsely. That does not help. Um, but we want to encourage them to start capturing some of the things that they are good at or that they do enjoy and getting them plugged into that. Uh, again, that's like a snippet answer on a really big topic. Um, but does anybody else have any questions? I know, like I was telling Sister, I listen all day, and so when someone gives me the chance to talk, <laughs> it's like, wind me up and watch me go. Um, so, so... I will, but I will say, if anyone has any questions, anything that they'd like me to speak to, I'm more than happy to. Yeah. So, I'm old, and maybe one of the oldest person in the room, but anyway, um, you know, if I go back and think about my childhood, things were very simple. You know, there was one TV in the house, no cell phones. You know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, my dad got to pick what sport he watched, which was primarily sports for Andy Griffin for John Knows, you know. Yeah. But it was it was all good, wholesome, you know, entertainment. And, and so I just can't help thinking as I watch the evolution of the generations that we, we just seem to complicate our lives tremendously. And, you know, I've been retired for five years, and I feel like some days my life is more complicated now than it was when I was, when I was working. Mm -hmm. You know? And it, it's all this technology. And you can get wrapped up in it. You know? I can get wrapped up in it just as easily as anyone in the room. But, you know, I think the most important, one of the most important things I think that you brought up was just, you know, all in moderation. You know, yeah. and it's up really up to the parents to do that. You really can't. You have to do it in a kind way, but it's just, but you really have to modulate the lives of your children. Right, right. And I would agree. We, you know, in the in the biz, we say everything in moderation except moderation. Um, and so, and so, yeah, I made dirt tacos under the kitchen window with leaves and grass. My kids have not made one dirt taco, and I'm really disappointed <laughs> in that. Um, and, and so you're right. There was a simplicity to some of that. We couldn't, and I actively resist some of it because I think I, there were times where I was absolutely unplugged. I was not connected 24-7 to my friends, and that was okay yeah. uh, as a kid. That's okay as an adult. Um, and so... And so, you know, I think encouraging, to your point, encouraging our kids um, to find the balance in things, uh, and again, to model that as grown-ups, too. And it's hard. We all get sucked into it as well. It's very reinforcing. It's very dopamine-releasing on a certain level. Um, so, so it's really, there's no fault in the fact that we get sucked into it. But as parents with fully developed frontal lobes, hopefully, uh, mostly, 
um, you know, we're in a little better position to sometimes see and, and set the limits, even when it makes us unpopular in our homes and sometimes with other parents and in our communities. So, I agree. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. I just want to say I appreciate you coming out and hearing what you have to say. I think these days, whether you have a six-year-old or a 10-year-old or a 15-year-old, they're growing way too quickly. And you have to think about these things. I think. Thank you. I appreciate that. And yeah, sometimes the reminder is good. It's things we know. It's things we've heard. It's like, oh yeah, I got it. I got to do that thing and actually do it. <laughs> we say that about a lot of things, but um, but that's why I say, look for the low hanging fruit. One or two things that you can that you can adjust at this point um, to just get the ball rolling on a little healthier healthier approach. All right. Well, I will let you guys go. If anybody has any comments they didn't get to add or ask, feel free to come up. I'll be hanging around a little bit. Okay? Thank you so much. Um, we'll pause for practical. Well, these are the practical tips that we can take away tonight and go home and apply to our own families. So thank you so much. Um, if you do have any of your kids in babysitting, please do take them home tonight. Um, we will go ahead and end in prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you again for joining us for our parent happy hour. We look forward to seeing you again soon.